Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones for this program. Uh, I note with sadness the passing of Dr. Walter Jones, a familiar face to many of us here. He was a regular attendee of this series. He had a deep love for Mississippi history, was a great supporter of the department, and we certainly will miss him, although it was a life well lived. Um, a few programs coming up I want to make sure that you know about. One of the Old Capitol Museum's most popular living history programs, Present Meets Past, will take place this Thursday from 5 to 8 p.m. over at the Old Capitol. It's free. It's great if you haven't been. Uh, there are folks dressed up as significant figures from the state's past. They include everyone from former governors to um, Ida B. Wells Barnett. Um, it, it, is, it is a great, fun evening at the Old Capitol Museum. And then on Saturday, October 27th, beginning at 10 a.m. at Historic Jefferson College, a property we administer just outside Natchez, we'll co-host the 11th annual Black and Blue program that focuses on the African-American experience in the Civil War. Uh, we'll have staff members from both the Museum of Mississippi History and the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum down there for that. Then in the afternoon, there will be uh, cavalry reenactors as well as dramatic monologues. It's a great program. If you have not gotten a chance to go to that, highly encourage it as well. Uh, next Wednesday is Halloween. And so for that History is Lunch, we'll have our old friend Peter Miazza with us to discuss his new book, Voices Heard from the Grave, Lives and Stories of People Buried in Greenwood Cemetery. Following the program, Peter will lead a walking tour of the nearly 200-year-old graveyard, which is just two blocks to the north of the Capitol building. There will be ghosts. Um, it's always someone from Natchez who asks. It's... Today, we are delighted to welcome Taiwo Gaynor, John Gibson, and Edie Green from Mississippi Public Broadcasting. They'll screen the original MDB documentary, Fannie Lou Hamer, Stand Up. If y'all did not notice on the way in, on the way out, be sure to pick up a free DVD of this. They're on the table out there. MPB has available. Tywell Gaynor moved from Brooklyn to Mississippi in 1998 to work with Bob Moses in the Algebra Project. Gaynor began working at Mississippi Public Broadcasting in 2008, where he is now director of post-production and produces such programs as Ed Said and Ampton and Wired. John Gibson joined MPB in August of 2015 to oversee the agency's television productions and production services. Under his leadership, the MPV team MPB TV team has won six Southeastern Regional Emmy Awards, five Tele Awards, and had five programs accepted for national distribution to PBS stations across the country, which really is fun. In 1998, Edie Green came on board at MPB, where she has worked on productions ranging from early literacy and dropout prevention to music, history, writing, and civil rights. Green has been recognized for her production work with four Southeast Regional Emmy Awards, an Edward R. Murrow Award, a Gracie Award, and numerous Tele Awards. John Gibson is going to come up and say a few words before we screen this documentary, and then we'll have an opportunity at the end of it for question and answer with everyone. Help me welcome John Gibson. Uh, thank you for coming out, and Chris, uh, we really appreciate the Department of Archives and History inviting us to come uh, share our documentary. Uh, it seems that uh, in these times, uh, emphasizing the theme of voting rights uh, can't be overemphasized. Uh, so we're really glad to be able to do this today. Uh, in 2017, we realized it was going to be the uh, 100th anniversary of Fannie Lou Hamer's birth and a good time to uh, make a documentary. Uh, we wanted to... Uh, uh, focus on the people who knew her and make it as personal and heartfelt a piece uh, as those people would want to would want to provide us, um, and that's I think what you'll see. Uh, I was uh, really excited to get to work with Taiwo and Edie, who a few years ago uh, co-produced the documentary 1964: The Fight for a Right, which uh, has been seen on more than 80 percent of the PBS affiliates around the country. Uh, so uh, they, they, they've, they're kind of a, a veteran team making uh, civil rights documentaries, and it was a, a thrill for me to get to work with them. Um, in case anybody doesn't know, MPB is uh, an agency of state government. We are the uh, uh, public TV provider and PBS affiliate for the entire state. We're also what's known as a, a dual licensee. We provide public radio statewide, 
Uh, so we're both the PBS and the NPR affiliate, as well as getting uh, material from our own original productions and from other sources. Um, we, uh, we are owned by you, and uh, we exist to be an educational and cultural resource for Mississippi, uh, and also to tell Mississippi's story. Um, and, and that's what this documentary is all about. So uh, we'll get on with the show, and uh, we'll all be available to answer questions afterwards. Thank you. I was 10 or 12, I just wished to God I was white, you know, because they had food to eat, they didn't work, they had money, they had nice homes, and we would nearly freeze, we never did have food, we worked all the time and didn't have nothing. We all lived on D. Marlowe's plantation and Fannie Lou worked on the DeMarlo's plantation. She worked there like 18 years. The persons who worked on the plantations, the sharecroppers, could not leave on his or her free will. I call it neo-slavery because it was, in fact, slavery. Ms. Hamer, she was 44 years old and had never lived any place but on a plantation. And uh, so she, she wanted to go. I mean, they were hostages, really. You know, they couldn't leave without approval of the plantation owner. And uh, they didn't get much money, so they didn't have a lot of money to uh, run away with. All of the, what they had accumulated were taken away from them by an overseer, a white overseer on the plantation, who poisoned their mules and destroyed their crops and uh, disabled their automobiles. But Miss Hamer, she was a very determined person, and she had been trying all her life to get away from the plantation. The direction of Fannie Lou Hamer's life changed in August 1962 when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, held a public meeting in nearby Ruleville. I can remember in 1962 this lady named Mary Tucker. She and my mom was best of friends. And she told my mom that they was having a mass meeting at William Chapel Church. And she asked my mom, did she want to come? And they talked about, you know, how it was our right that we could register and vote. And they were talking about we could vote out people that we didn't want in office. I had never heard until 1962 that uh, black people could register and vote. And you can understand why you got 70 percent of the population of the whole county uh, black uh, and then you got nothing but white people in office. So then uh, they asked who would go down on Friday, which was the uh, 31st, to try and register. So I went down. I was one of the person that said I would go. And people were really nervous about this trip to try and register to vote, a hostile act directed at white supremacy. I was on the bus, and, and, and everybody on there was afraid, even myself. White men in trucks were driving by, waving guns, and yelling, uh, you know, obscenities at us. And so these people on the bus were kind of upset, and Fannie Lou Hamer started to sing. This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine. She began to sing this little light, and people calmed down and were ready to face whatever they had to face. And just with the power of her voice, it was clear that she was easing the fear. Well, it didn't take long for the registrar and other people to shut down the circuit clerk's office where you went to register to vote. And so now people had to go back home. When they was on their way back home, they got stopped by the highway patrol. And the reason they got stopped, the highway patrol told them that the bus was too yellow. You riding the school bus, what other colors gonna be? 
before she made it home, quite naturally, the registrar called D. Marlo and letting him know that Fannie Lou was down there trying to register the vote. And uh, the landowner dro drove up. He said, you will have to go down and withdraw your registration or you will have to leave this place. And I didn't call myself saying nothing smart, but I, I couldn't understand it. And I answered in the only way I could and told him that I didn't go down there to register for him. I went down there to register for myself. And she, he said that, uh, well, you, you'll you have to go. And so he pulled away, and she went back into the house. She would leave her husband and her two daughters on the plantation and that she would leave so that they could bring in the crop so that they wouldn't owe the plantation owner any, any money. Daddy took Mama to Miss Mary Tucker's house. On the 10th of September of 1962, my daddy felt some kind of way that mama wasn't safe there. So we all got together, packed up some clothes, and he got my mom and took her to Sumler, Mississippi. Mr. Hamer's premonition was accurate. That very night, the Tucker house was attacked. The 10th of September is when they shot in that house 16 times, you know, to kill me. On the bus trip to register to vote, Mrs. Hamer had caught the eye of civil rights organizers who then wanted her to attend a SNCC conference in Nashville. Bob Moses called me and told me to go and find the lady who did the singing on the bus. I found her up in Tallahatchie County in a little uh, shack, plantation shack, and I walk into the room. There's this wing back chair uh, with the back to the door and uh, pot belly, stove, coal burning, red. And I said, uh, Bob Moses sent me to get Fannie Lou Hamer. And she stood up and said, I'm Fannie Lou Hamer. I mean, ready to go. I mean, didn't know if I was a kidnapper or what. You know, didn't, never thought about that. She left with him, and that woman been traveling ever since. Mrs. Hamer's presence at the 1962 SNCC conference in Nashville, where you could see for the first time you know, a local person from Mississippi reflecting exactly what you wanted to find in the rural South. It becomes clear we're dealing with somebody different. This is no submissive, docile, servile sharecropper. This is a woman of considerable strength. When she stepped forward, I don't think anyone in SNCC realized how strong she was, and she may not have realized how strong she was. And so Fannie Lou Hamer was just what we had been looking for. She didn't wait around. I mean, she just got right to work continuously. We canvassing communities and encouraging people to uh, go to the courthouse. She said, because voting is your voice you know, to decide on who you want to represent you or who you want to be your president. On June 9, 1963, Fannie Lou Hamer was returning by bus from a voter registration conference in South Carolina. They stopped and went on the Mississippi. And some of them wanted to use the bathroom, some of them wanted to get food. But at the time, she was still on the bus. And when she did decide, she seen them running out of the place. And she stepped off to see what was going on. And somebody told her to get back on the bus. But this highway patrolman hollered at somebody else, told, get that one there. 
which was my mom, and they took him to jail. And I was beaten in jail till my body was just hard as metal. I'm suffering now with a blood clot in the artery to the left eye and a permanent kidney injury on the right side. From the time that I began working, I never had a mind to stop. But after that happened to me in wine only, then I knew that it wouldn't be anything would stop me other than death. In 1964, Fannie Lou Hamer was one of the founders of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, a racially integrated pro-civil rights alternative to the state's segregated Democratic Party. With the new party support, Mrs. Hamer ran for Congress. Walked into the the Secretary of State's office, and this quiet lady uh, said, "What you what you niggas want?" Said <laughs> we looked at her, and then and then Miss Hamer said, "Well, I want to run for Congress." And then she go back in there. And she said, "Hey, hey y'all," said there's two niggas out here. Said they want to run for Congress. 10, 15 eyes are now on us, you know? And so we started standing there. And so she come and put this pile of papers on the counter and said, fill these out. Fannie Lou and I go out into the corridor up there and fill out the papers, bring them back. She says, okay, these, this is okay, but you need a cashier check, five, hundred dollars made out to the Democratic Party Executive uh, Committee. So we go out into the corridor, to the phone booth, call the COFO office in here, and tell them that um, we need five hundred dollars. They said, don't move, stay there. Somebody will be there with the money. Okay. Sit around a while, then a guy shows up with the check. We take the check into the office, give it to the lady, and start to leave. She said, hold it. So there's one more step. Said at the time the candidate qualifies, the campaign manager has to sign these papers. And she said, this is the last day to qualify. It's 4 o'clock. We're going to shut this down at 4.30. And if you don't get this all in the day, you're out of luck. You won't be able to run. Fannie Lou Hamer looked at me and she said, Mac, go in there and put your name on them papers and let's go home. I said, oh, Miss Hamer, come on now. You know, I don't know nothing in the world about being a campaign manager. She said, Mac, you know as much about being a campaign manager as I know about running for Congress. Put your name on the papers and let's go home. In August 1964, Mrs. Hamer was a member of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party's delegation to the Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City. There, as the nation watched, the Freedom Democrats demanded to be recognized as the only legitimate Democratic Party from Mississippi. Everybody knew that the state of Mississippi discriminated against black people, denied black people the right to vote. Everybody in the Democratic Party knew that the Democratic Party of Mississippi was an all-white and white supremacist party. They weren't even loyal to the Democratic Party. They came to the Democratic Party's conventions supporting Barry Goldwater, the Republican. <laughs> And they weren't registering really any uh, black folks, really, because we were carrying hundreds of people. We carried over a thousand people down there to make that application uh, to register to vote. The right to vote was our whole reason for this. But we had to now, since we wasn't getting any place in Mississippi, uh, we needed to now make the National Democratic Party put pressure on the local delegation to be democratic. Our challenge before the Credentials Committee was to try to deny the credentials to the regular uh, Democratic Party. Mrs. Hamer spoke before the Credentials Committee in 1964 in Atlantic City to let um, the Credentials Committee know that the, the integrated delegation should be seated as opposed to the old white guard. 
And Mrs. Hamer was chosen to speak because of the fire that was in her spirit, uh, because of her, her articulation, and really because, because of her eyes. It wasn't too long before three white men came to my cell. One of these men was a state highway patrolman. And he said, we're going to make you wish you were dead. When you looked into Mrs. Hamer's eyes, you knew she meant business. You knew that she had been through a lot and just her very presence commanded respect. I was carried out of that cell into another cell where they had two Negro prisoners. The state highway patrolman ordered the first Negro to take the black jack. The first Negro began to beat. And I was beat by the first Negro until he was exhausted. I was told that there were people uh, at that, on the credentials committee, in tears when they listened to Mrs. Hamer tell her story. After the first Negro had beat until he was exhausted, the state highway patrolman ordered the second Negro to take the black jack. The second Negro began to beat and I began to work my feet. And the state highway patrolman ordered the first Negro had beat to sit on my feet, to keep me from working my feet. I began to scream and one white man got up and began to beat me in my head and tell me to hush. All of this is on account of we want to register, to become first class citizens. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? Thank you. We thought we had the case won. We thought that we had come here and we were going to uh, uh, get these, the National Democrat Party to say, OK. With Mrs. Hamer's testimony, at that moment, without knowing you know, the kind of arm twisting that was going on in the background, the kind of threats um, being made by the White House, Lyndon Johnson's White House, it seemed as if, to me, there would be an actual vote permitted on whether or not to seat the MFDP. And my feeling was that if you got that vote, a majority of the convention would vote to seat the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. But behind the scenes, President Johnson and party leaders had no intention of allowing a vote by the full convention. Instead, they offered a compromise, allowing two members of the Mississippi Freedom Democrats to be recognized as delegates at large. So they offered us that what they call a compromise of two seats at large, uh, really representing nobody. Some are wanting to accept the compromise, and uh, most of the SNCC people are saying no, and um, they take us off into a little meeting uh, where they're separating us to try to persuade uh, us to accept this compromise. And so, and then, um, and then Mrs. Hamer standing up and, you know, just saying, we shouldn't do this. We are not going to do this. And then all of us, the delegates, vote with her. So although at one level the challenge failed, that is to say that the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party uh, was not seated, uh, at another level, you have to acknowledge that the challenge changed the Democratic Party and in a sense changed the face of Democratic Party politics in the United States. Shortly after the convention, Fannie Lou Hamer joined fellow SNCC activists on a trip to Africa. She became really proud and more of statesman lack, you know. She, she. I think she, when she saw these African people and the and the way they're 
the leadership there, and 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 uh, she just kind of this this lifted her. It was just remarkable. I you know I saw some of the most intelligent people. You know people because I had never in my life seen you know where black people running banks. I'd never seen nobody you know behind a counter in a bank. I had never seen nobody running black running the government in my life. So it, it, it was quite a revelation to me, you know, it was because I was really learning something for the first time because then I could feel myself never ever being ashamed of my ancestors and my background. After the 1964 elections, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party challenged the legitimacy of Mississippi's congressional delegation. Fannie Lou Hamer was one of three women who traveled to Washington to oppose the seating of five Mississippi congressmen. For the opening vote, the black ladies are asked to stand, and they gave them a seat finally, in the back of the U.S. House of Representatives. And that challenge allowed Fannie Lou Hamer, Victoria Gray, and Annie Devine to be the first black women to be seated on the House floor while the challenge were heard. Despite her role in the national civil rights movement, Fannie Lou Hamer remained active in her local community. She starts doing the most practical kinds of things and telling people, plant tomatoes. We are hungry plant beans, plant okra. You know, back then, people didn't have food. Half time, didn't have clothes. And when she would go to different areas up north, she would tell them that, you know, people down here in the south, they needed clothes, they needed food. And they would send boxes and boxes and boxes of clothes. Our front porch would be stacked up with boxes, with clothes. I watched this lady sit out in, the, in her front yard and peel peaches and pears and put them up in jars and give them away. We just thought, you know, if we had land to grow some stuff on, then it would be a help to us because, you know, living in, on, on the farm, on some plantation, they still don't give you a place to grow stuff. So we founded Freedom Farms uh, in 1969, and we uh, grew our own vegetables, you know, like butter beans, peas, okra, potatoes, peanuts, mm -hmm. and then uh, cash crop. The plan of the thing is that it can grow to produce enough that people just won't know what home it is. She had a component of that Freedom Farm called a pig bank, where she uh, was able, through the National Council of Negro Women, to accumulate some pigs. If a family came in and they were willing to take a piglet and uh, raise this piglet, and then when this piglet got grown and had uh, pigs, they would bring a piglet back to the bank to replenish the bank so that she could give more people. Mrs. Hamer looked out for Rueville, for Sunflower County, and uh, she shared whatever earnings she received so often with people in the community. She would buy lots so their house could be built on that lot. She believed that a family ought to have a house they ought to have education, and they ought to have uh, food and a job. I couldn't just afford to sit down and not do nothing. And I know something out there is happening, you know, and I know I can say something and say, you know, this is not right, and I'm going to get out of here and we're going to do something about it. Indigenous leadership, you know, part of, of them. And uh, you, you think about a person running for Congress sitting out in the yard sh shelling peas. She was able to encourage us to keep on moving. She was able to inspire and encourage us from her own physical pain. And she will go down in history as one of the greatest folk leaders 
that this country has ever produced. She was an awesome person. Whether she was cooking, whether she was singing, or whether she was trying to take somebody, get somebody to go to the polls and register. But whatever she did, she did her part. And I say this, she was an awesome woman. I loved her. I still love her. I miss her. Can't get no better than that. Fannie Lou Hamer died on March 14, 1977. She was 59 years old. Her good friend Charles McLaurin arranged for her burial on land she owned. A few days before she passed away, uh, and I went to visit her, and she said, uh, Mac, promise me I will not be buried on a plantation. I've been on a plantation all my life, and I don't want to be buried. We, we have a commitment to keep her legacy alive. The statue was one way that she'd always be standing tall in the Delta. We'd set it up as high as it's setting so that people who come to the statue We'll be looking up at her. Chris, what happens now? <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about y'all's parts in making that? Any thoughts that you may have? And then we'll open the floor to questions. All right. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming and sharing with this uh, screening with us. Um, we are very proud of this project. Um, we all work collaboratively on this on this uh, in a very short amount of time. Uh, this was originally for the 100th anniversary of her birthday, and um, so one of the things that uh, we wanted to make sure that we did was keep true to what her messaging was. So it was important for us to use Fannie Lou Hamer's words. So we got her oral histories. That was, that was easy. We just let her tell her own story. And we spoke to people who knew her directly. And um, you know we kind of wanted to emphasize the stories that were told about her through um, reenactments. So we uh, had one of our fellow staff members, Belinda, play our Fannie Lou Hamer and we shot the reenactments around town. Uh, we didn't want to be too over the top, but we wanted to send a message that, uh, you know, this was something very serious and, and she was a remarkable woman, you know, and that her story needed to be told correctly. Um, we, uh, Edie Green, uh, uh, her husband Fred, played original music uh, along with uh, Zeke Bandy, our audio person, and myself. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we stay true to Miss Famer's um, legacy of this little light of mine. So all of the music that you heard uh, uh, underneath was re recreations of this little light of mine and different variations. And of course, we used her singing at the end. Um, but you know, we're very proud of this. We we, uh, we uh, think it's a very important story, and um, we'll be happy to answer some questions later on. I'm going to let Edie say something. Well. Ty was, Ty was kind of being modest. Um, it was a challenge to get several of these people to come for interviews. Charlie Cobb lives in Jacksonville, Florida. And Virgie Hamer was very ill, and she lives in, um, lived in Memphis. And Tywo used 
all that wonderful title will gain her charm and convinced her she needed to be in the interview, drove to Memphis, set up a place in Walls, Mississippi that we could interview Mrs. Hamer, drove to Memphis, got her, brought her to Walls, then after the interview took her to lunch. He and uh, Mrs. Mrs. Faulkner got really quite close. I mean, it wasn't just that, that people appeared. There was a lot of effort to um, persuade people to, to talk. So I, I think he deserves a lot of credit. And uh, Virgie, Virgie uh, Hamer Faulkner passed away shortly after uh, the interview was done. So that was, that was her final interview. And we're uh, really glad that we were able to to uh, get her reflections recorded for posterity uh, when we did. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge um, Fonzie Brown Wright, who's in, in our documentary as well. Uh, she will next week be celebrating her 55 years in civil rights work. Um, we worked with her daughter, Cynthia Palmer, who helped give us, get us access to a lot of these civil rights veterans. Um, one of the things that's remarkable about this place is that there are so many of these veterans amongst us that you know we're kind of unaware of. You can go to Kroger and see uh, uh, the uh, our fellow uh, Ole Miss man walking around in the frozen section. So you know it's good that we have them while we're here, and it's important to tell their stories. And um, if we have any questions, Mr. Goodwin will pass a mic around. He wanted me to make sure and clarify that we need to speak into the microphone. And I would be happy to answer questions. I grew up uh, in the Delta in Washington County, and I think that Freedom Village was in Washington County, wasn't it? Uh, and, and, and about her agrarian interest, you know, it seems like that uh, that could be something that could be picked up on because I know the average size of a farm is like 500 acres in Mississippi. And it'd be nice if people could grow their own uh, food. I agree. I think that was extremely forward thinking of, of uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. The idea of having freedom farms and the pig bank and, you know, kind of helping people to realize that they can take their own destiny by their hands. Um, she was very much, uh, I mean, just kind of going through this project, realizing that she was a living saint, literally. Like, everything that she did benefited other people. And she died literally with no money. And that says a lot about who she was and what her mission in life was. Thank you. Thank you so much for the documentary. What is the message that you want me to take away from watching the film and seeing what the contribution that Ms. Hamer made to Mississippi? She made a wonderful contribution, giving her life and battle she had in the jailhouse and what what is it that we we owe her so much especially as black women in the community we owe her so much so what is your message what would you say what, what would you tell me that I need to do to finish the journey and I was the fall guy because I was young at the time I know you can't believe that of her her for, of her death so I was, my first job was working with the with um, North Mississippi Rural Legal Services, and I had to keep the office while everybody else had to attend at the funeral. So, and she said that what she hated most of all in her last days were that nobody came to see her. Well, thank you for your work, first of all, and thank you for your words. Um, I think Mrs. Hamer helped all of all of America and all of humanity and by, by changing politics. I, for me, the two things to take away from this are that her story gets told and that uh, we vote. To me, voting is, is, is critical. Yeah, that's, that's my, personally, my biggest takeaway. How dare anybody not vote after so much, uh, after so many people suffered uh, to, to be sure that right was, was, was protected. And I tell people, if you can't stand either candidate in a race, go sign in to show, show that you were there and, and uh, make sure nobody takes you off the rolls. Uh, you know, how, how dare any of us not vote? 
after it was bought at that cost. Um, thanks for that excellent hold up. Hold, hold documentary. Up your thanks for the <laughs> excellent documentary. Um, I would bear, um, just piggybacking on what was just said and just the previous question. Um, in 1962, when Fannie Lou started, there was just 6% of the eligible black people were allowed to vote. After activities in the civil rights movement, some 70% by the time we get to 1970, some 70% of the eligible Votes, black people were eligible to vote. So in a matter of less than a decade, the voting increased substantially because of our activities in the civil rights movement. So I think that um, we should all take away the, the import. In another two weeks, we are going to be voting, and we should all, all of us, it is very important, vitally important, the sacrifices that were made from some of our four parents, especially Fanny Luema and the um, MF, MF uh, um, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. We should all take away her um, sacrifices and make sure we vote because of the sacrifices that were made so that we can now vote. Um, my simple question is, um, do you, do you know which country she visited in Africa? I thought it was, was what's now, what was Ghana. I thought it was West Africa. Do you know? I think you're right. I think I'm right. Okay. I, I think that uh, Mrs. Hamer's testimony before the Credentials Committee was so powerful. Um, I know from the other documentary that Taiwo and I worked on that that the president, that, that it was interrupted. It didn't play on national TV until later that night. They taped it and played it. And it made, got so much attention, I think that it really led to the Voting Rights Act, which then increased African American registration. Hi. Uh, I would just like to know if you all are airing this between now and, again, between now and Next, uh, Tuesday for voting. It's it's not scheduled to air right now, but it is uh, available online, and uh, we've already uh, we've already seen a couple of national sources referencing it, and including the link uh, on different news sites. Uh, so we we do encourage people to share it. Oh, and and uh, while this may or may not uh, help it get played before. Uh, before election day, uh, I think I mentioned uh, about 220, 230 of the 290 PBS stations around the country have picked this up. So uh, we'll get 70 or 80 percent carriage. Hi, um, thank you so much for this great work. Um, I think it was just perfect. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, we, we talk a lot about voter apathy or people registering and then not showing up. Um, what are we, are, are, do you have any plans to show this to schools or give it access to community centers where kids and people that feel like they can't make it or disenfranchised can see it? So they can be reminded of the sacrifice and what all that had to happen for this to be shown today. Well, um, Tara Wren from our Communications and Education Department is here today, and she might know better than I about, uh, uh, I didn't mention before when I talked about TV and radio, uh, MPB does a ton of outreach in schools, uh, from early literacy to uh, job training to, uh, for uh, people in their teens. So there's a lot of different efforts going on. And Tara? I'll give you the short answer to that, and that is yes, 
was just whispered in my ear. We do a lot of boots on the ground education work, and we one of our goals um, this year and a year to come, we're going to really beef it up, is to do take these documentaries that Mississippi Public Broadcasting does, and to turn them into educational pieces for classrooms across the state of Mississippi. And this is a perfect time to start. So yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Tara. The documentary mentioned that she died at age 59, correct? Uh, do you all know whether or not her death was uh, contributed to her beating in the jail by the state trooper and the two black men? And if so, has Mississippi offered an apology to the family on behalf of the Highway, Highway Patrol Office? And have any reparations been made to that family if that death was caused by her beating by the Mississippi Highway Patrol Office. She had breast cancer. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a different uh, question. I taught kindergarten one year. Uh, I'm a nurse and I just was in mission and I taught kindergarten, <coughs> excuse me. And I, I wanna know, is Dr. McLemore here in the, in the room? No, okay. And could you tell me afterwards where I can find him? Because I taught a boy named Bruce McLemore. I want to know if it's him. Okay. <laughs> yes. I attend church with one of Fannie Lou Hamer's grandsons. So I'm wondering, do you know if any of his family members have had an opportunity to view this particular documentary? Well, we did screen this documentary. Well, we... We broadcast the documentary for the first time last year to coincide with her 100th birthday. And we, uh, we gave um, a DVD and it was taken to Ruleville at the Fannie Lou Hamer Museum there where they screened it. And Virgie Hamer did make it to that screening and she was able to see. And I believe she died maybe 13 days after that screening. Um, her children, I'm not sure if they have seen it. Um, it is broadcasting nationally. It is. Um, all over the, yeah, it's all over, and they can take one of the DVDs, of course. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, the, you know, there are, Virgie has two other daughters, I believe, that um, are still living, and uh, I mean, Fannie Lou has two other daughters who are still living. Um, so, you know, we, we would hope that they, they are still, um, you know, able to share in her life and see the story about her. Just a quick postscript. Good, evening. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have had an opportunity to uh, work with the Canton School System for about 12 years. And just this past uh, February, March, I, I showed that film to uh, six classes of students in the Canton High School. Then the second point is a, is a, is a teaching, teachable moment. I want you all to know why Mrs. Hamer was chosen to be the spokesperson person. I knew Mrs. Hamer. I worked with Mrs. Hamer. Mrs. Hamer was chosen to appear before the Credentials Committee because, as I mentioned, of the fire in her eyes. Her two cohorts, Mrs. Annie Devine from Canton, my hometown, was a school teacher. Mrs. Victoria Gray from the Hattiesburg area was also a teacher. But Mrs. Hamer had that fire that you could see in her eyes. Mrs. Mrs. Devine was soft-spoken. Uh, Mrs. Gray was very intellectual, but Mrs. Hamer brought it. <laughs> Mrs. Hamer brought it. So when Mrs. Hamer opened her mouth, you had to listen. And when she appeared before that Credentials Committee in 1964, as someone said, there were tears, and I saw tears in this room today, and I could almost shed a tear, just the fact of the sacrifices that Mrs. Hamer and so many other people have gone through being forced to be beaten by her own people. Uh, and, and when you tell that, it just sounds, oh, well, that couldn't have happened. It happened. It happened. And so I just wanted my last point. Please, everybody, go out and vote. And as I teach and lecture people, when they say, well, why should I vote? My one vote doesn't count. It may not. But you had ancestors who couldn't vote. You had grandparents great-grandparents and relatives who couldn't read nor write nor vote. 
So if you don't want to do it for you, you tell your folk when they ask you, why should I vote? Well, listen, baby's kids, if you don't want to go and vote for yourself, you vote for the folk who didn't have the opportunity to vote. And that's why you must vote, because you are representing those ancestors who did not have the, the, even the opportunity to even go to school and learn. That's for another day. But go and vote and take everybody you know. And if you're not registered, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I'd like to add something to that. Um, one of the things that we realized, especially doing the first documentary, was that uh, we didn't have a very good representation of the women who were part of the civil rights movement. And women were very much active in the civil rights movement. You know, one of the, it could be probably said that uh, the men got the attention because of the way society was built at that time. But the women very much did all of the hard, heavy lifting. Um, and, you know, speaking of, of Victoria Gray and, and Annie Devine there, and Fannie Lou Hamer, there were many women just like them that are unknown. And, you know, it, it makes me proud, especially where we are in this election cycle, seeing all of these women coming through that are about to really start pulling the levers of power. And I feel proud that we're able to show this powerful woman of Mississippi kind of telling that, taking that story and making it go forward. So. Hey, uh, um, I just also want to say just thank you, thank you, and thank you for getting this document, this just getting this together to show um, in this day and time too, um, as well. I'm I'm so moved because just like um, I'm an organizer here in Mississippi and here in Jackson, um, doing a lot of the work that Fanny is doing. And so many other people around here doing the same work. And people think that it's irrelevant today. And it's still relevant today that we do this type of work. And I'm thinking about how this, this week and today is just Wednesday. It's been so trying and, and so testing for the state of Mississippi, period. Um, Monday, I went to a town hall meeting um, regarding Willie Jones Jr., man from Forest, Mississippi, who was hung. It was a lynching, not a suicide. Um, so coming from that and then yesterday was the MHSAA um, hearing about the Forest Hill high school students here in Jackson, Mississippi, about their, um, their band performance. And, and, and being present in those hearings and seeing how we as community activists, as community people, not even activists, just regular old people who, fam who Fanny just embodied so much just being a person who deserve rights, who deserve to hear, who deserve to be able to um, voice their opinion about how they're living and not for you to tell them how they're living. Um, and seeing people speak up and step up in the community about harassment about death threats that they're getting today in 2018 because they spoke out about some students who should not be punished, should not have to apologize about an act that other people did not understand and didn't ask to understand but wanted to punish them. So I'm thinking about that leg work and, and just thinking about like there are still people today being um, their lives. And then, so I'm going through a period where I don't have money that much. And I just went to a farm yesterday. I talked to my grandma on the phone the day uh, before about how I wanted to make some chili, but I didn't have all the ingredients. I went to a farm yesterday, and he said, just take, take what you need. I said, oh, I can make my chili now. <laughs> so that's also going on. And I thank Fanny again, Ashe. I thank her um, for starting the Freedom Farms, because a lot of people here in Jackson, Mississippi, are embodying it. I'm from the Mississippi Delta. I'm not from Jackson. I've been here since 2014, since I've been in school. And it's, it's amazing. I just I thank you for all that. And, and then, real quick, I'm just going to speak on voting, too, as well. Um, the way she embodied and the way that she talked about voting was very plain and simple. 
because I want to, because I need to, and because I have to. That's all I hear from Fannie when I hear about voting. And that you don't have to be uh, privy to um, having a degree, having owned a house to vote. And, and, and voting not being as, sim as simple as just voting people into office. But voting against things, voting people out, is what I heard Fannie say. Um, so, also, my generation has been disenfranchised. This man right here spoke about 70% um, of people being eligible to vote after what happened with civil rights. Do you know that number today? It's lower. So that tells me that people are still being disenfranchised. As low as it's in the 40-something percent percentile, if folks just want to know numbers. Um, so their eligibility is, is lessened now. Why? Because people are being disenfranchised. And my uh, youth folks are feeling that their votes just don't matter. And we have to, it's our job to also educate people on what voting actually is. It doesn't stop at just electing people. And it also ends about keeping people out and also being able to know that your voice will be heard and people will work hard for it like Fanny did. So that's all I want to say. <laughs> I'm not sure if I need to say what I was going to say now. Uh, we need to know each other. I've been active here for 55 years, uh, keeping the sidewalk warm for people coming later. I, I just wanted to, when I raise my hand, um, add to what Ms. Wright said about, um, to, to say that Mrs. Hamer didn't just, <clears throat> didn't just get people registered to vote, but she gave them another choice herself as a candidate. And I, I think in addition to voting for the people who are on the ballot, now, we also need to give a lot of thought to who else ought to be on the ballot, what other values and, and ideas and goals need to be on the ballot. And until we do that, we're limiting ourselves and, and that vote. And we need to give it a lot more thought than we really have been. I was interested in this comment that you're saying people are being disenfranchised. Does that mean they are being kept from being able to be registered to vote? And how is that happening? Explain how that's happening. So one way we talk about, I usually use a simple um, expression that everybody else has probably been um, familiarized with voter ID registration. So I talk about that and people think that that's not a real thing or that how in the heck could that keep people from voting? Well, you have poor people still, right? Who don't even have transportation to go get an ID, will never, and don't have the time because they still work from day in to day out. ID is very disenfranchising for some poor people. That's just one simple reason why. And if I told you here just then how a person yesterday at a city hall meeting said that they were threatened and, and followed by people because they spoke out against a vote to keep a director, a band director in school was followed and threatened. Do you think other people in other towns are not being threatened? I think it's definitely happening. And it's happening in more ways that we, that we don't know. I could talk about gerrymandering. Do people know something about that? Redistricting, redistricting, I'm sorry, my am Yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, that's another way that people are definitely being disenfranchised. Their voting precincts are being changed, being taken away from them. So that's as simple as that. Well, let me, I, 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 I love this series in part because we usually run out of time before we run out of questions. <laughs> and I think that's a great thing. That has happened again. But I know that all of y'all will be able to talk to one another directly right now and ask these same questions face to face 
as well as any questions that you may have for our panel. Look, we didn't have any books from our folks today, um, but we do have the DVDs to give away outside. We have a fabulous museum store. If you would like to learn more about the life of Mrs. Hamer, there are some books over here that you can take a look at. Thank you all for coming today. I hope we see you next week.